turning there, marking there. Um, for those of you that have signed up for the Bible College, it's going full bore and they're being blessed. They've just started, which means you can still show up tomorrow for Milt's class. Amen. Um, inductive Bible study, you can't show up. It's full, so we're not going to let you in. But you can take it the next time we offer it. Uh, and you can also show up Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, for Genesis. As they didn't meet this week, they'll be picking it back up this following week. Uh, the marriage community groups are basically being set up, divided, and everything. You'll be getting emails from where's there from Jim and the home group leaders and everybody. Um, so if you haven't signed up, sign up and put a star next to your name so they can designate you're someone that hasn't signed up yet and get you in the right group. And finally, 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 because you can always get the bulletin or go online, this Sunday we are having a baptism. Um, there's 11 people signed up? There's 11 people signed up. Hallelujah. Absolutely. So, you know, we're, it'll be a great time of worship. It'll be a great time um, it, because it's at George's house. So, hey, we don't have to clean up. Just kidding. <laughs> Of course we're going to help clean up because we're Christians. Um, but you know what? If you have not been baptized, and I'll make the same announcement on this coming Sunday, why not? You need to get baptized. I mean, it, we're actually going to talk a little bit about it in today's study because it is an outward expression of an inward work of the Lord. And Jesus said, if you confess me before men, he'll confess you before the Heavenly Father. So, this is a great way to say, hey, all you angels out there, all you demons out there, and all you folk out there, I belong to Christ. Amen. So, now you don't have to be baptized to be saved, but you really should because it's a wonderful, it's one of those earmarks in your life. So, we'll just leave it at that. A um, lot of things going on. Um, if you want to get involved in worship, if you want to be involved in the sound booth, sound I mean, there's a lot of ways. Sunday school, you can teach the next Billy Graham by just joining in in the Sunday school. So a lot of ways to get involved, and we want to help you to utilize your gifts. Amen? Amen. Well, let's go to the Lord. 2 Kings chapter 23, John chapter 16, let him ask him to bless our Bible study and I'm probably sounding a little nasally because I'm having a sinus thing going on. So we'll ask him to actually help me to go through it without going through puberty. You know, that change of voice thing. Some of you have been here before. You know what I'm talking about. Well, Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you. And Lord, we just want to take this time literally to drink you in. We've come here for one purpose. I know I'm here because I love you and I want to know you better. So Lord, we ask that as we spend this time, it would be time well spent at your feet. That we would learn of you, that we would know you better. Lord, that we would have an idea of what is required what you are asking each and every one of us to do. We know our purpose. Our purpose is to worship you. But Lord, in every one of our lives, you have prepared a perfect plan. And we ask that through your word, you would help us to realize it. So bless this time now. Holy Spirit, fall upon us. Give us hearing ears, seeing eyes, receptive hearts. We love you, Lord. And we dedicate this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Is there a prescription for a revival? You know, a pill that we can take that might help the world, well, awake. Don't we need it? According to R.A. Torrey, godly man, he said that there is a prescription for revival, but it's not in the form of a pill or a magic wand. The prescription that will bring revival to any church, community, or city, according to Tory, begins with number one, let a few Christians get completely right with God. If this isn't done, anything else you do is all for naught. It, it doesn't come to anything. It's essentially a big waste of time. Well, even here in Bible study, it's our heart when we walk in. Lord, if I'm not right, make me right that I might 
receive and know you more. Secondly, let them bind themselves together to pray for revival until God opens the windows of heavens and comes down. I kind of like to see that. Now, for a lot of people, they'll pray for a week, a month, two months, three months. But you know what? Sometimes we're called to pray for nine years for the same thing. And trust me, it'll not be for naught. That's a double negative, so we'll edit that. Number three, let them be at the disposal of God for His use, to use as God sees fit for the winning of others to Christ. That's it. Those three things. That's all? Yeah, that's it. There's nothing more? No, that's it. You see, Tori says that this prescription has never failed, and it can't fail. Why? Because this recipe, it rests on you. It doesn't rest on others, it rests on you. You see, you have to understand, it's dealing with, and revival really is, an individual responsibility. Really? Absolutely. See, revival is not a pastoral responsibility, though pastors do pay a role, play a role. It's not the elders' responsibility, though elders will play a role. It's not a corporate responsibility, because corporate responsibility is more about publicity, more so than piety. Revival is each and every Christian's responsibility. Why? Because you can't schedule personal repentance. You can't legislate prayer. Those, those, well, those are just works of the Holy Spirit. Revival is a work of the Holy Spirit. Repentance is a work of the Holy Spirit. Prayer is a work of the Holy Spirit. And it happens when you, me, we are truly right with God. That's when true revival begins. But if I, as a pastor, try and legislate my convictions on you, it doesn't ever work. Why? Because it's a fact. You can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make that horse drink. I could stand here and tell you truth after truth that you will not receive, unless you're right with God. I could teach the Word of God, but I can't make you love it. I can walk with Jesus, but it doesn't mean you will. And that's exactly what we see right here in 2 Kings chapter 23. As Josiah will commit to making a change in Judah. But the question becomes is, will it be enough or will it be too little too late to stay the fate for the seeds that have already been sown? Look at 2 Kings chapter 23 beginning in verse 1. Now the king sent them to gather all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to him. The king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and with him all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in the hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the house of the Lord. Now, for those of you that weren't here last week, it's basically a little remembrance. Last chapter, Helakah the priest was searching the temple. They were looking for the money that was designated for the construction and the upkeep of the temple. And, and they found a copy of the Word of God in the house of God. Which is amazing because how can the Word of God get lost in the house of God? Well, it's pretty easy, obviously. And so they find this copy of the Law of Moses, which he gave to Saphon, who took it to Josiah and read it to him. From beginning to end, one sitting, he read it to him. Now at this point, upon hearing the word of God, Josiah tears his clothes, a sign of humility and brokenness and repentance, as he realized that the people of Judah had been completely in rebellion and in open disobedience to the word of God. And according to the Word of God, because of those actions, judgment was looming. So he sent Hilakai the priest, Ahakem, Akekabar, 
Saphon and Ahasa to Huladah, the prophetess, who proclaimed God's judgment on Judah. Judgment's coming, you can't stop it. But because of Josiah's heart, it says that his heart was tender, that he got right with God, and so God promised to spare him from seeing this judgment. You're not going to see it. So instead of going on an extended vacation, Josiah says Hilakah the priest and his four friends to get the elders, the priests, and the leaders of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem to assemble at the temple where he personally reads to them the word of God. He doesn't get a priest or a scribe. He personally reads the word of God to them. And please note, so far what have we seen from Josiah? personal responsibility for his own actions. See, he, he, upon hearing the word of God, he realized, I'm not doing this, we're not doing this, and he gets right. He takes personal responsibility, he repents, he gets right with God, and now he begins to seek others to join him. But notice what he does. He gathers them for the hearing, for themselves, the word of God. You know, he, he's not legislating change. He's saying, hear this word so that it will make that same change in them. He doesn't command his convictions. He's the king he could. He wants them to hear so that the Holy Spirit will convict. And this is important to us. Why? Because revival, repentance, are all the work of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's the grace of God that allows these things. Well, what do you mean it's a work of the Holy Spirit? Well, leave 2 Kings and turn to John 16. We're going to see exactly what Jesus had to say about this. John 16, we're going to pick it up in verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. Jesus is saying, hey, it's good that I die. For if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he, speaking of the Holy Spirit, has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you in all truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. He will glorify Me, for He will take of what is Mine and declare it to you. And all things that are of the Father are Mine." Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Well, please note, what will the Holy Spirit do? Well, he will take what is the Lord's and declare it to you. Well, what's the Lord's? The Word of God. He is the Word, and he will declare it to you. And see, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to proclaim the Word of God. We're, we're not supposed to proclaim our convictions. We're supposed to proclaim the Christ. Yes. Amen. We're not supposed to beat people up saying, do this or go to hell. I mean, that's a byproduct of them rejecting it, but that's not your job. Your job is to simply proclaim. Amen. And when we proclaim as we're guided in truth, the living truth, in Love, see, we do this in love. We proclaim the living word when the Holy Spirit at that point will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin? Well, well, because we all fall short. I mean, does anyone here, can anyone here say, I've kept all the Ten Commandments? No, but there's 613 laws. And so if we can't keep the ten major ones, what about the minor ones? Oh, yeah, we all kept the one about not eating bats. Yeah, you know what I mean? Well, maybe someone here ate a bat. I don't know. 
But every one of us can sit there and say, yeah, I have lied. I have lied. I have lied. Yes, I have stolen. Yes, I've done that. I've actually murdered because Jesus said if you have anger in your heart against your brother without a cause, you've murdered. Jesus said, hey, and we've all committed adultery because guess what? Jesus said, hey, if you have lust in your heart, sorry. Four out of six. Oh, hey, who hasn't blasphemed the name of God? What do you mean? Well, before you were saved, did you ever do you know, the GD? Do you ever use Jesus, the name of Jesus, not in a way to honor him? Absolutely. The world does it, and you watch it on film. Five out of ten. Should we go on? No, we all sin. We all fall short. And, but Jesus says, listen, their judgment of sin is because they don't believe in me. Why? Because he died for all those things. Amen. You're not going to be judged for those things. We're only judged because we reject the Christ of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. In other words, He was the righteous propitiation for the sins of mankind. His sacrifice was perfect. Listen, none of us can die for ourselves. We would be rejected. But because of what Jesus did, we will be accepted. Hallelujah. And of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Listen, Satan's time is short. The devil is defeated. You in Christ are victorious over all these things. And that's what happened in the heart of Josiah. He heard the word of God and it was like, ah! Oh! And now Josiah wants the priests and the elders to hear with their own ears what he's heard. So he personally reads the word of God to them, trusting that same regeneration will happen in their heart. He doesn't argue. He doesn't legislate. He simply proclaims. And that's what the Apostle Paul tells us and commands us to do. Young Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 24. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all. Able to teach, patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. What's that? Listen, apart from with Christ, apart from Jesus Christ in your life, you are a captive to the devil. You're his little puppet doing whatever he wants you to do. That's just the way it is. But listen, repentance is a gift of God. God grants repentance. You just have to open your heart. Well, how do I know? Receive Him. Repentance is purely just saying, God's right, I'm wrong, I'm going to do what God says to do, and I'm not going to do what I want to do. But I know so many Christians, that's all they do is what they want to do. Well, they need to really seek God. See, real repentance is of the Lord, and Josiah knows that he will not be able to motivate real change. That can only come from the people one heart at a time. Real change is motivated by love. Not because you have to, but because you want to. Amen. He loved me so much he died. Now I'm going to live with him. I want to live for him because I want to. I don't have to. I want to. Well, what happens next? Leaving John 16, go back to 2 Kings chapter 23. Look at verse 3, 2 Kings 23, 3. Then the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all of his heart and all of his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people took a stand for the covenant. Well, that's interesting. Good leaders lead by example. And you know a good leader because of their example. Do you know what I mean? See, a good leader is an example, and you can follow that person because there's something to follow. A bad leader is not a good an example, and you don't want to follow that because there's nothing to follow. 
And here Josiah is saying, I'm going to keep the word. And you hear what the people said? Go do it, dude. They agreed, took a stand for the covenant. They didn't say, hey, us too. Hey, yeah, good job. Way to go. Yeah, you do that. It's interesting because here Josiah makes a public stand, a public declaration. And that's really the picture of what baptism is. It's making a public stand, a public declaration of, of who you are. That's, that's the only reason why I think it's important to be baptized. I mean, of course, Jesus says to. That's probably even better. But it's, it's standing before the people of Ju Judah. And he, what he's saying, he's saying, I'm going to love the Lord my God with all of my heart, with all of my soul, and with all of my mind. And all the people joined Josiah and they think, yeah, you do that, buddy. All right. You keep all the testimonies. You keep all the statutes. You keep all the law, all 613 of them. You know, really, this is the very first promise keepers meeting. It is. It's the very, I mean, hey, let's make promises. Yeah, everybody, yeah, make promises. But will it keep? Where are the promise keepers today? I don't know if you guys remember the promise keepers in the you know, late 80s, 90s. Oh, then they just really shot up into the late 90s and early 2000s. And where are they now? Are they keeping their promises? And, and well, if we assume that everyone's going to keep their promises... If you assume everybody's going to keep your, if you assume you're going to keep your promises, somebody's going to get disappointed. But listen, if we rely on God's grace and God's truth, that He will keep His promises, it makes it easier for us to keep all of our promises, right? Why? Well, again, Matthew 5, where Jesus tells us not to swear or make any promises. Don't make any promises. Don't, don't put your hand on the Bible. Don't, not on your grandpa's, grandma's grave. Not on your children's life. What does he say in verse 37? But let your yes be yes and your no, no. For whatever is more than this is from the devil, from the evil one. Don't make promises. Just be a doer of the word, not a hearer. You know, and revival is never, ever the making and keeping of promises. It's not a list of do's and don'ts, checking it twice. Revival is because of the amazing, incredible grace of God. As we look to Him with individual responsibility, remembering what God promised. What did he promise? Well, let's look at an Old Testament prophecy. Zechariah chapter 4. You guys remember this. It's not by power nor by might, by, but by your keeping my promises, right? By your keeping promises, saith the Lord of hosts, right? That's, that's what that says. Not by power or by might, but you keeping your promises, right? No, that's not what the scripture says. He says, not by power or might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. It's you working in concert with God, but it's His power that's going to cause you to do it. Amen. And let me just say, if the Spirit of God is moving in your life, you will keep your word. <laughs> I've yet to know someone that says, yeah, I'm walking in the Spirit, but I'm lying and cheating. <laughs> what? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I'm a Spirit-filled man cheating on my wife. What? Listen, it's going to be a move of the Holy Spirit working with you as you take individual responsibility, which is the difference between a matter of duty versus desire. Oh, I've got a duty list. I got, I, God's not going to love me unless I do this, 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 this. No, no, no. I just desire to please Him. It's a big difference. Just like your spouse or your kids or anybody, you know, I have to do this or my wife won't feed me. I want to please her because I love her. It's a big difference between have to 
I have to, or I want to. Ought to? All right. For you Texas people out there, ought to? All right. And it makes all the difference in the world. And it's all the difference between what looks like love versus what true love is. You know what? And, and, and ladies, I'm going to say this to you. Listen, I understand we, you, you like to hear it, but wouldn't you rather we show you we love you? What, 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 I mean, seriously. I mean, do you want me to tell you all the time I love you and then treat you like garbage? Or do you want me to treat you like a queen and love on you and never say it? I you know some people looking at each other going, <laughs> you answer that question. <laughs> See, what, it, what the bottom line is this, is the difference between relationship and religion. And Josiah is a type of the church. He's a type of a Christian. And this is a picture of the last days. And how God said, I will spare you from the generation that goes into tribulation. Just as God has said, I will spare his church. I will spare my church from going into tribulation. So what does Josiah do? He's made a promise. He said his his course into action here. Look at verse 4. And the king commanded Hilakai the high priest and the priests of the second order and the doorkeepers to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the articles that were made for Baal and Asherah and the hosts of heaven. And he burned them outside of Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carried their ashes to Bethel. Josiah isn't a man who's just going to make great speeches. You know, there's a lot of people that make great speeches. You know, and he's not a guy saying, there, hey, everybody, read the Word of God. Pray every day. Tell people about Jesus. Do good works and everything will work out. Oh, no, 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 no. Josiah is the guy that does what he said he was going to do. He doesn't wait for everyone else to get on board. He gets busy cleaning house cleaning out all the idols, all the articles that were made for Baal worship. And Baal worship is the worship of knowledge and intellect. Literally what it is, is it's, it's man thinking, wow, I'm so smart, I'm going to worship me. You know, Stephen Hawking, all these people, oh, let's, let's worship intellect. And what that leads to is, is the worship of the creation instead of the creator. Ashra. Ashra is the, is the worship of sex and war. Sex and war. They had uh, articles that were used to worship the host of heaven. You know, this includes the zodiac and demonology. We talked a lot about it last week. So literally, they had a Ouija board in the temple of God. <laughs> Let's see. Why? E. S. And what Josiah is doing is to cleanse the land. See, he can only do what he can do. And, and this is what Christians are called to do. See, we're not called to do anything except for deal with our own stuff. See, he's the king, and so he can do what he can do. Because he wants to. A Christian doesn't want anything and shouldn't want anything to interfere with their relationship with the Lord. You know, because a real relationship with the Lord is a real intimate relationship. I mean, it's intimate. I mean, it's like, wow. And, and, and if there's anything that's separating you from that worship, from that intimacy, because if you really have a relationship with the Lord that's as intimate as God wants you to, your spouse should in a little bit maybe be jealous, going, oh, man, he really loves the Lord. But it's a good kind of jealousy. And while Josiah, he's cleaning the temple, and again, it's the picture of a believer's heart, cleaning the heart. See, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The, and the Christian, God dwells in you, and, and, and it's like you got to clean out the gunk. You don't put it in boxes. You don't put it in storage. You clean it out. You burn it. You don't have a garage sale. You don't put it on eBay. You burn it. 
See, a lot of Christians, they want their cake and they want to eat it too, but not Josiah. He removes all these articles of devil worship, and that's really what it is. It's devil worship. He burns them, and then, you know, burning is not enough. He, he gets all the ashes, he picks it up, and he takes it as far from Jerusalem as he can, and he dumps it in Bethel. I wonder what that says about Bethel. But see, the, thing, the point is here, we all must deal ruthlessly with sin and rebellion. You know, the same way sin and rebellion deals ruthlessly with you, you must deal with it. Because sin ain't going to take any prisoners. It ain't going to let you off the hook. Well, look at verse 5. And then he removed the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense on the high places in the city of Judah and in the places all around Jerusalem, and those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun, to the moon, to the constellation, again, we're dealing with the zodiac, and to all the hosts of heaven. Josiah removed the idolatrous priests. And this here just doesn't mean that he fired them. You're fired. No, 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 no. Circle that word removed. In the original Hebrew, right above it or right in your margin, write this, put down, exterminate, destroyed. Whoa. He really killed them? Oh, yeah. Absolutely he did. Deuteronomy tells them he should. But listen, and you have to understand that Josiah makes a covenant to keep all of the law. All of the law. And to really follow the Lord. See, he wasn't messing around, you know. He wasn't picking and choosing which laws to keep. He wasn't going into the Bible going, well, I really don't like that one. I don't like this one. I'll do this one. Yeah, I'll love anybody, okay? No, he wasn't picking and choosing. No, 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 no. He was keeping all of the law, good and what we might call bad. But it really isn't. Look at verse 6. And he brought out the wooden images from the house of the Lord to the brook Kidron, outside Jerusalem, burned it at the brook, brook Kidron and ground it into ashes and threw its ashes on the graves of the common people. That's weird. Listen, for a Jew to walk on a grave, on a grave site, was considered touching a dead person and you would be ceremonially unclean. You, in fact, they mark the graves. If you can't be put in a tomb, they would put white stones around it so you knew to walk around because if you touched that stone or you touched that grave, you were unclean. So what Josiah is doing, he's burning the ashes, saying, you're unclean, I'm burning you, and then he throws it on the unclean, saying, you're doubly unclean. I mean, I don't know if that's double cooties or how, how it works, but he's saying, I'm making you doubly unclean. And that way, no one's going to touch it. Get away from it. And in verse 7, then he tore down the ritual booths of the perverted persons that were in the house of the Lord. And I use intonation on that. Where the women wove hangings for the woman images. What's that? Well... They had put in the house of the Lord booths where male prostitutes and female prostitutes did their business. And the hangings, basically the hangings are kind of like, you know, going to a concert and you buy a t-shirt, you know, for you Bieber fans, you get a t-shirt. You know, it's like, it's kind of like the idea, you know, you go to Vegas, you get a shirt that says, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, because you need mementos to always think back on the debauchery you just did. They're glorying in sin. And he took care of it. What else did he do? Verse 8, and he brought all the priests from the cities of Judah and, the, and, defiled the high, and defiled the high places where the priests had burnt incense from Geba to Beersheba. He also broke down the high places at the gate, which were at the entrance of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were to the left of the city gate. See, this is a referendum on reform. 
for the entire country. He's going into the northern territories and cleaning house there too. And, and reform, and just so you, we understand, reform's not bad. It's not bad. But listen, only a relationship with the Lord translates into lasting change. You know, these slow change that you can, you know. No, no, no. Only a relationship with Jesus is change that you will agree with. Now, the, how many millions and millions of laws are there concerning traffic? You guys ever see, like I know in California, they have three books this thick for the traffic laws. I mean, if they can't get you one way, they'll find somewhere, somewhere else to get you. It's like, well, no, no, it's not in this book. Let's go over here. Now, I don't know what it is in Arizona, but they have, I mean, literally, how many, how many civil, how many social, how many traffic laws are there? Millions upon millions. And, and all, even though you have all these laws, who here doesn't speed? Hmm? Hmm? Well, if you're walking, that doesn't count, but maybe you're walking too fast because I, I guarantee you they got a wall about it. You're walking too fast. But you understand what I'm saying? You have all these laws. You know, we legislate, you can't kill. And how many murderers are there every year? How many? See, you can legislate all you want, but only a relationship with Jesus Christ only a move of the Holy Spirit where there's a regeneration of the heart will bring about real change. Amen. Look at verse 9. Nevertheless, the priests of the high places did not come up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, but they ate unleavened bread among their brethren. So some of these priests are disqualified from administering the worship of Yahweh because they were in the high places worshiping Yahweh. And that went against the law of Moses. See, God has legislated to us in His Word how we should worship. It ain't whatever you want to do. The New Testament says if you truly want to worship God, you must worship in spirit and in truth. Spirit and truth. Anything else is not worshiping the Lord. You might get warm and fuzzies, the back of your hair might stand up, but it's not spirit and truth. They had to come to Jerusalem. They had to come to the temple proper. Anything else was not true worship. And because these high priests made it convenient for the people by worshiping to Yahweh in the high places, they were disqualified. And so Josiah took their priest cards and tore them up. Sorry, you're no longer a priest. But he let them actually eat unleavened bread with the brethren. So he didn't kill him. So that's one thing. Verse 10, he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or daughter pass through the fire of Moloch. In other words, he abolished abortion. He removed the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the son at the entrance of the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nahath Malach the officer who was in the court, and he burned the chariots of the sun with fire. The altars that were on the roof, the upper chamber of Ahaz, which the king of Judah had made, and the altars which Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord, the king broke down and pulverized them and threw their dust into the brook Kidron. They had stuff everywhere. I mean, everywhere, on the roofs, I mean, everywhere, there were idols, there were icons, there were, you know, shrines, everywhere. And Josiah turns not one stone, he finds them all, destroys them all. He defiled the places where Molech was worshipped. Circle that word defiled and write destroyed, made unfit, and the idea was... It can never be reused or built again. Think about this. Think about like Chernobyl. You know what I mean? Or like a chemical dump. He made it so that the land was unsuitable for anything. Now the Brook Kidron, this was right outside the walls of Jerusalem. And just so you have an idea what it is, it was 
kind of like the dump. I mean, but not more than just the dump. It was the outdoor septic tank of the city. So everything in their bathroom went into the Kidron Valley. And that shows us what he thought of their idols. Your idols are exactly what comes out of your body. Poop. Verse 13 then the king defiled, same word as verse 10, the high places that were east of Jerusalem, which is on the south of the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon, king of Israel, had built for Ashtoreth, the abominations of the Sidonians, for Chumath, the abominations of the Moabite, and for Milcom, the abominations of the people of Ammon. Now he built these altars, these shrines for his wives so they could worship their gods, and he started worshiping them. Now, the Mount of Corruption is the Mount of Olives, just so you have a perspective, which 400, a year, er, 400 years earlier, he built these incredible, incredible shrines. Now, 400 years later, and again, 400 years later, and how many kings? Josiah comes along and tears them down. But I hope what you see here is he's not just tearing down demonic idols. He's tearing down people's traditions. Because they've been there for 400 years. Other people worship them. They're, they're just like a mainstay. That would be like us going to Washington, D.C. and saying, the Washington Monument, which is this kind of funky pyramid, um, that's a demonic icon. Tear it down. What would people do? They would freak out. Sometimes to really have an intimate relationship with the true and living God, it, it means tearing down traditions that go back generations and destroying what many people might call national landmarks. Many things that have been maybe handed down in your families. They're, they're just national treasures. They're they're. they're treasures to our family generations back but listen if you really are on a quest to wipe out sin sometimes you got to do the hard thing we'll look at verse 14 and he broke in pieces the sacred pillars and cut down the wooden images and filled their places with the bones of men wow he did this not only to render the places as unclean but to make a point See, these pillars, these images, these, these idolatrous images, they represented dead bones. See, you could pray all you want, they weren't going to answer. You could worship all they want, they weren't going to help you. And the only worship, the only relationship that can help is that of worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See, the worship of the true and living God. But Josiah is not done yet. He's not done yet. We still have, oh, gee, um, 19, 19 more verses. Moreover, verse 15, moreover, the altar that was in Bethel, now do you guys remember the altar that was Bethel? That was where the original calf worship began. Um, it's, you know, or Jeroboam, he became king, and he was afraid the people would go to uh, Jerusalem for the celebration of the Passover, and they, they would basically turn their hearts back there. So he said, no one's allowed. So, you, you know, remember, guys, remember the used in the Russia, they built a wall to separate people from going into the West. Remember that wall? This was their wall. This was their wall. See, some things never change. And so he built this altar, and they, he made a calf, and they said, that's the God that brought you out of Egypt. And people started worshiping it. So, moreover, the altar that was at Bethel, and the high places with Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin, had made both the altar and the high places he broke down, and he burned the high places and crushed, crushed it to powder. And he burned the wooden image. Finally, about 400 years later, 
comes a king to tear down the altar of Jeroboam. Now, there actually is, and when we all go to Jerusalem, either by way of the Lord bringing us there or by going and visiting, up in the Tel Dan, there's the second altar that's still there. It's been excavated. You can see it. So you can actually see where they did this calf worship. But here, it's gone. Josiah is not only trying to undo the sin of, of his age, but he's also trying to go backwards hundreds of years to undo that sin before he was born. It's a remarkable, remarkable story and a remarkable picture of this young man who's in his 20s. Verse 16, And Josiah turned, and he saw the tombs that were there on the mountain. He's speaking about Bethel. And he sent and took the bones out of the tombs and burned them on the altar and defiled it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these words. What words? Well, if you go back to 1 Kings chapter 13, you're introduced in verse 1 to an unnamed prophet who comes and prophesies against the altar of Jeroboam. Now, in the next verse, it says, this is what his proclamation was. O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David. And on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places whom burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burned on you. Hundreds of years before Josiah would be born, that was the prophecy. And here is Josiah fulfilling that prophecy. Now, no one can sit there and say, well, you know, they just said, hey, I'm going to have a kid named Josiah and he's going to do that. Sorry, it just doesn't work that way. Now, it took a few hundred years, but it came to pass. Why is this important to us? Well, people may not like everything that the Word of God has to say, but please listen. You may not like everything it's saying, but it's going to come to pass. Amen. So the idea is this. It's going to happen. And everything that's going to happen in the future is right here. We know the end of the age. We know what's going to come. We know the ending. We know who wins. And so we can either get on board or we can miss the train. And, and you may not, again, you may not like what it has to say. Sorry, I didn't write any of it. And there's not one dot or tittle that will not come to pass. Not one dot or tittle. It'll all come to pass so we can get on board with what God is doing or not. But if you don't, you can never say that God didn't tell us. Listen, no one out there can say, I didn't know. The most still, the number one selling book out there is the Bible. You can, spy, I mean, you can go anywhere and find a Bible. You can't say, God didn't tell me. God didn't warn me. He did. He did. What else did Josiah do? Look at verse 17. Then he said, What gravestone is this that I see? So the men of the city told him, That is the tomb of the man of God who came from Judah and proclaimed these things which you have done against the altar of Bethel. So he, Josiah, said, Let him alone. Let no one move his bones. So they let his bones alone with the bones of the prophet who came from Samaria. Now Josiah took away all the shrines of the high places that were in all the city, that were in the cities of Samaria, I threw in that all, so take it out, which the king of Israel, which the kings of Israel had made to provoke the Lord to anger. And he did them according to all the deeds he had done in Bethel. He executed all the priests on the high places who were there and on the altars and burned men's bones on them, and he returned to Jerusalem. There's an interesting contrast here because we see Josiah honors the prophet of God but executes judgment on the idolatrous priests. 
and, and, and basically, he's, again, he's just cleaning house from top to bottom. He's cleaning house from top to bottom. And then he returns to Jerusalem. Well, why is he going to scrub the city so much? Why is he scrubbing the nation so much? Why is he doing all this so much? He's not making a lot of friends in high places, if you know what I mean. Well, what he's doing is he's cleansing the nation of all the leaven. And this is him saying, this is a new beginning. This is a beginning of a new age. This is the beginning of a nation. But the problem isn't with Josiah. The problem is with everyone else in the nation. Not everyone wanted a fresh start. Not everyone saw the need to repent. Even though Josiah did, not everyone else wanted it. So he could only do what he could do as the king. And not everyone was going to have the same heart as Josiah. And that's why it's important that we have the heart of Christ. Because if we have the heart of Christ, anything that God wants to do, we'll be okay with it. Look at verse 21. Then the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover to the Lord your God, as is written in the book of the covenant. Such a Passover surely had never been held since the days of the judges who judged Israel nor in all the days of the king of Israel and the king of Judah. But in the 18th year of Josiah, this Passover was held before the Lord in Jerusalem. Do you see why he had to go through and clean the nation from top to bottom, why he had to scrub? You see, you've got to remember, part of the Passover celebration was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where you were to go in and make sure you got all the unleavened out of your house. Unleavened was a picture of sin. You had to get it all out. Get it out, get it out, get it out. And so it makes no sense for you to, to clean your car when your house is a pigsty. You know what I mean? Well, you know. Clean the house, then worry about the car. And that's what he did. You know, he's going to clean. I mean, why am I going to get the leaven out of my house? Look at all the altars. Look at all the shrines. Look at all the idolatry. Look at the devil worship. Look at all this stuff going on. And we're going to do the Passover? It makes no sense. They say that this was a Passover like there had not been since the days of the judges. Now, Samuel was the last of the judges. And what makes this one different? is such a complete cleansing of the nation. And since Samuel's death, who was the first king after Samuel? Saul! Saul! So you, you could see the compromise that was beginning in the nation. And here they are, going through the religious traditions. This is also what made this completely different than the other ones. It's been over 300 years since the northern tribe had come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, which they're doing. See, it's the entire nation celebrating. Verse 24, Moreover, Josiah put away those who consulted mediums and spiritists, the household gods and idols, all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and Jerusalem, that he might perform the words of the law, which were written in the book of that Hilakai the priest found in the house of the Lord. You see those words put away there? Two words in the English, one word in the Hebrew, right above it, right? Burn, consume, exterminate. He doesn't just put it in a box and put it in the garage, you know what I mean? He absolutely gets it completely gone. Now, a lot of people are going to say, man, the, the, this is so cruel. These guys are harsh. I mean, what evil people. But please, know this is the only way you can deal with sin in your life. The only way you can deal with sin is if you starve it. You have to completely starve it. If you feed it, it will grow and consume you, which is exactly what had happened to both the northern and southern kingdoms. They were consumed with this sin. And for many people, that means cleaning house, removing those things that keep pulling you away from God. And listen, we all have to be willing 
to turn over a few tables in our own houses before we have any right to point out any flaws in someone else's. Living this kind of way may not make you very popular with man. But look at God's opinion of Josiah. And personally, I, I think that God's opinion is more important than what anyone else is going to think of me. Look at verse 25. Now before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all of his heart, with all of his soul, and with all of his might, according to all the law of Moses. Nor after him did any arise like him. That's a pretty cool thing for God to say about you, you know what I mean? You know, and there's only one person that I have control over, and that's me. There's only one person that you have control over, and that's you. Now, you will have to stand before the Lord and have an account for your life. You will have to make an account. You won't have to stand before the Lord on my behalf, and I won't stand before the Lord on your behalf. And if God said and gave me the option, hey, would you stand before the Lord on someone else's behalf? I'm going to say, no thanks. <laughs> They're on their own. i got to stand before the Lord on my behalf. So Josiah's zeal is traced down to his own accountability. And God lets us all know that he's very well pleased with him. Very well pleased with him. I, mean, I can't think of a greater endorsement that a man could receive of the Lord than to say, there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all of his heart, with all of his soul, and with all of his might, according to all the law of Moses. Nor after him did any arise like him. Wouldn't you like that to be your epitaph, you know, when, or when, when you get up before the Lord and, and you know, of course, St. Peter isn't going to be there to greet you. Sorry, <laughs> it's not going to happen. But if he was, he could say, next up, Steve Ryan. Hey, there was no one like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might, according to all the law of Moses. That's pretty cool. Now, I'm grateful because Jesus kept the law, so I don't have to. But I would still love to hear the Lord say, Well done, good and faithful servant. You served me with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your might. Welcome in. Enter into your rest. You know, that's good enough for me. I don't even think I would mind saying, Well, David, you made it by the skin of your teeth. Come on, welcome. <laughs> And, and, and I can laugh about that, but I am truly grateful, and you should be too, that we're saved by trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ and nothing else. We still all have to make an account for the things that we do with the knowledge of Jesus Christ and in Christ. And that realization and the prompting of the Holy Spirit should move us to doing what is right and good in our lives. It's not because I have to, it's because I want to. And He gives me the strength to do it because myself, I don't want to. I want to go the other way. I want to speed. I want to say, hey, I wonder if I can go 110 miles down Gilbert. <laughs> Verse 26, Nevertheless, the Lord did not turn from the fierceness of His great wrath, which His anger was aroused against Judah because of all the provocation which Manasseh had provoked him. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah from my sight as I have removed Israel. And I will cast off this city, Jerusalem, which I have chosen, and the house of which I said, my name shall be there. Manasseh really, really was like the cherry on top. I mean, he really caused the people to turn from God by introducing a lot of really evil and defiling things. And he's the one that introduced the prostitution into the temple, and he's the one that, that put these shrines inside of the holy place and the holy of holies. I mean, he just did a lot of things. But we have to remember, go back a few chapters. Manasseh repented and was restored by God. 
But when society gets to this place where they're, again, worshiping the creation and they've cast the creator out, then it's only a matter of time before judgment will come. And isn't that where we're at as a society? No, 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 no room for the creator in our schools or in our workplace or in our courthouses. No, 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 no. The only, the only room we have is for really smart men because we're worshiping Baal, intellect, science. It's only a matter of time. Now, as long as the church, in other words, you, me, we, as long as we continue to seek the Lord and purify our own lives, then judgment will be stayed. What do you mean? Well, see, this is a picture of, Josiah is a picture of the church. He sought the Lord. He turned to the Lord. And, and, and see, we're right now in what we call the dispensation of the Gentiles or the church age, whatever you want to call it. But judgment's going to be stayed until the church is taken out, raptured. Really? Oh, yeah. It's 2 Thessalonians. Paul tells the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6, he says, and now you know what is restraining, there's something that's restraining or something that's holding something back, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. This is the spirit of Antichrist, lawlessness. It's already at work. It's already deceiving people. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Okay, I don't get it. Okay, the He, if you look, it's in capital letters. Okay, so it's dealing with the Holy Spirit. Okay, He, the Holy Spirit, was placed upon the church, and He still is today. Hallelujah. Now, while we're praying and seeking the Lord, seeking to purify ourselves, getting the Word out, He's restraining evil. You think it's bad? take the Holy Spirit out of the way, and you haven't seen anything yet. But when He is removed from the church, we learn in Revelation, it will be, the Holy Spirit will be placed on Israel, and that begins Jacob's trouble. And 144,000 super evangelists will come out. There'll be angels flying around going, hey, you need Jesus. Oh, and if anyone's not saved here right now, guess what? You need Jesus now, because then... <laughs> You don't want to go through it. You don't want to see it. So the Holy Spirit will be removed from the church and the church will be taken away. And we'll be with the Lord. Seven days is the, is the, is the wedding feast of the Lamb or Israel's wedding feast. Seven days. On the seventh day, the groom will reveal his bride, the church, to us. We'll return with him seven years. So, it's a, it's a whole study in itself, and I'm running out of time. Verse 28. Now, the rest of the Acts of Josiah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? In his days, Josiah's days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went to the aid of the king of Assyria, to the rivers Euphrates, and King Josiah went against him. And Pharaoh Necho killed him at Megiddo when he confronted him. What's that? Why would he go to the aid of the Assyrians? Well, that word aid is an old English word. Circle it and right above it, right, or in your margins, write against or in opposition to. Uh, again, it's an old English word that means to oppose. And here, Necho was being raised up by God to oppose the Assyrians who were now in decline. And as they were in decline, the Babylonians were being raised up by God to be the next world power. And it would be the Babylonians that would come and take Jerusalem to take Judah captive in three different separate sieges. Now, when this was happening, Necho sent a messenger to Josiah saying, Hey, stay out of the way. Don't get involved. God has called me to war against the Assyrians. And God did tell him to do that. And God did allow him to defeat the Assyrians. But 
Josiah got involved and he was killed. Why would he do that? Well, the full account we'll read in 2 Chronicles chapter 35 when we get there, and it's greater in depth. But let me just sum it up with a proverb for you. Proverbs 26, 17 sums up exactly what Josiah did. Look at this. He said, He who passes in metals in a coral, not his own, is like one who takes a dog by the ears. What's that? Grab a dog by the ears. Guess what? You'll get bit. And he got bit. He got involved in a fight he was never called to get involved with, and he got killed. And the challenge for us as the church, the challenge for us as Christians, is to make sure we're only in the fights, that we only are in the battles that God calls us to fight. That we're under the control of the Holy Spirit, moving in the Spirit. Otherwise, We'll get bit too. Look at verse 30. Then the servants moved his body in a chariot from a ghetto and brought him to Jerusalem and buried him in his own tomb. And the people of the land took Jehoahaz, his, the son of Josiah, anointed him and made him king in his father's place. Now this is the oldest son, so of course he's made the king for a while. Look at verse 31. Jehoahaz was 23 when he became king, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. Three months. His mother's name was Hamotal, a name everybody wants, and the daughter of uh, Jeremiah, but not Jeremiah the prophet, of Libna. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all his fathers had done. He did a lot in three months. Now Pharaoh Necho put him in prison in Riblah, in the land of Hamath, that he might not reign in Jerusalem, as, and he imposed on the land tribute of a hundred talents of silver and, a, and of a talent of gold. Then Pharaoh Necho made Elikem the son of Josiah, that's the uh, middle child, middle child, um, trying to think of the three sons. So, so my three sons, this is the middle child. Was that Chip? Or that was the oldest one, right? Huh? Ernie was the little one. Who was, who was the middle one? Robbie. Robbie. Okay, this is Robbie in our story. Because, I mean, do you really want to pronounce that name? Robbie made Robbie the son of Josiah, king in the place of uh, his father Josiah, and changed his name to Robbie. And Pharaoh took Jehoahaz and went to Egypt, and he died there. See, Jehoahaz was very rebellious, rebellious against God and rebellious against Necho because Necho basically said, do whatever I tell you to do. And he said, no, I'm not going to do it. So he said, fine, you're not going to be king. So he made the middle child, Robbie, king. Why? Because he was easy to manipulate and push around. And Jehoahaz, he dies in bondage in a foreign country. Verse 35, as we complete our study tonight, so Jehoiakim gave the silver and the gold to Pharaoh, but he taxed the land to give money according to the command of Pharaoh. He executed, he exact, excuse me, he exacted the silver and gold from the people of the land, from everyone according to his assignment, or his assessment, sorry, and to give it to Pharaoh Necho. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zabada and the daughter of Padaha of Rumah, and he did evil on the sight of the Lord according to all his fathers had done. Now Jehoiakim is the king, the same king who the prophet Jeremiah comes to in Jeremiah chapter 26. And just so you understand, Jeremiah brings him all these prophecies written down. The king reads them, tears them up, and burns them. See, they were the warnings of God, the pleadings of God for the nation to repent. And he throws them on fire. Like thinking, well, if that's going to change, oh, I'm going to burn them and then God's not going to do it. Listen, you, you can burn the Bible all you want. The word of God is still going to come true. And it's been the same old story. There will be those who refute it, who rebuke it, and who reject it. But it will never change the reality of it. The Word of God is sure. 
but when a people or, of a na or a nation embrace the word of God and are doers of the word of God, then the blessings of God will bring prosperity to that people. But when evil men are in power, they will place heavy burdens on the people to pay for their mistakes. And God allows it. Why? To get your attention. To get your attention. Are you, high, are you tired of the gas prices? Are you tired of the tax burdens? Are you tired of these things? Don't, it has nothing to do with the election. It has everything to do with your relationship. Amen. And please, 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 please get my heart on this. Never look at men or a man because every man and every man in politics will shipwreck your faith. Instead, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Amen. Look to the Lord. Look to the Word of God, which will establish you. In fact, it's Hebrews chapter 2, verse, chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Look to that, and you will do well. Amen? Amen. Well, Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for this truth. Heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will remain and it will stand. And Lord, we ask that as this is a beautiful picture of your church, of your saints, Lord, that you would move in our hearts. It wouldn't be an edict. It wouldn't be anything other than a move of your Holy Spirit in us to get right. Lord, that we would all get right with you. And then we would seek you in prayer. And then we would be at your disposal to be used any way you seem fit that this word would get out. That's revival. Revival. Lord, it starts with me. Let it begin here tonight, I pray. You know, if your life is shipwrecked here tonight, do you feel shipwrecked tonight? I just want you to know, the Lord is ready to get your life back in the water, to get you back on track, to put wind in your sails. The Holy Spirit here is here to move in a very mighty way in your life. And all you need to do is turn your heart to Jesus. Now, I'm going to conclude this prayer, and that speaks to you. If you feel shipwrecked, come. Come, come, come. We're here to pray with you, and the Lord is here to bless you. Lord Jesus, we ask you to do this in our sight, because it's marvelous, marvelous, that you would be glorified here. We love you and thank you, and we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.